In this chapter, we're going to cover insurance. And insurance is an important concept in business law because it's a conceptual way of managing risk. Um, in business, of course, we insure almost everything we can. We also insure things in our personal life. And like I said, insurance is just, um, it's just a contract. And it protects against risks and perils. Risks are threats to things we want to protect. So life, health, property, income, savings, investment, reputation, and so forth. Uh, I protect my house. I insure my house against a fire. Perils are dangers that a party might pose to others and against which that party must shield itself. So perils are different than risks because perils are things I can do to injure others. When I'm driving, I have to have liability insurance by law because I might have a wreck and harm someone. So I'm not protecting my property, I'm protecting other people. And then insurance, of course, is a transfer of the risk of economic loss from the insured to the insurance company. Function of insurance then is to distribute each person, person's risk among all others who may not be imperiled that year or over many years. So insurance is risk sharing. We all pay, everyone who chooses to be insured all pays into one big pot and a company manages that risk and they predict that the amount total that they receive in premiums will be more than the amount they have to pay out in total. So it's risk sharing. Insurance policies, like other contracts, are going to require just the same elements as all contracts. Mutual assent, capacity, consideration, and legality. So mutual assent, we know that's a meeting of the minds. It means that the insured and the insurer have agreed on terms. They sign a contract. And they, are, they have capacity, so nobody is mentally impaired. Nobody's a minor. Nothing like that. The consideration is the premiums that are paid. And then, of course, the subject of the contract has to be legal. I can't insure my building against fire and then set it on fire. Um, things like that. So I might want to protect against these following events. Disability, death property loss and liability. Any of these things, of course, would have huge financial impact on me. And, and you can see on the right, we've listed for you strategies for reducing that financial impact. And of course, there are strategies besides insurance. Disability, for example, I can save money. I can invest money. I can also have disability insurance. And insurance is a component in risk management. It shouldn't be your own personal or your business's only means of risk management. You should have lots of things in place. Property loss, for example. I do need to have insurance. I need to have auto insurance, homeowner's insurance, flood or earthquake insurance. I also need to repair and upkeep my property. So if you have a business in the future, you need a risk management plan that involves insurance and many other ways to mitigate risk. The insurance contract has the following parties. There's the insurer who accepts the risk of loss in return for a premium. This is the insurance company. And they agree to indemnify or compensate the insured against the loss in specified in each contract. There's also the insured, which is the party protected by the insurance contract. And then there's the policy, which is the contract of insurance. There could also be a beneficiary. This person is not a party to every contract. A beneficiary is a third party to whom payment of compensation is sometimes provided for in the contract. A lot of a lot of insurance contracts won't have a beneficiary, but if you have a life insurance contract, for example, it'll have a beneficiary. So if I have a life insurance contract on my husband's life, or he has an insurance contract on his life and he passes away, that life insurance policy will pay proceeds to the beneficiary. So if it is his children, if it is me, they will receive the compensation from that life insurance policy. To obtain insurance, one has to have an insurable interest, and that's the financial interest that a policyholder has in the person or property that's insured. 
All people have an insurable interest in their own lives and the lives of their spouses and dependents. Business partners have insurable interest in each other because they could suffer financial loss if a partner dies. A corporation usually has a financial interest in its key employees for the same reason. With property insurance, anyone who would suffer a financial loss from damage to property would have an insurable interest in that property. An insurer has a threefold duty once a claim has been placed on the insurance policy. First, they have a duty to investigate the claim, to determine all the facts and to decide in an appropriate manner if a client is entitled to payment. If, if the client is entitled to a payment, they have the duty to pay. The insurance property must be replaced or repaired. It must also pay any claim by a third party based on any liability clause in the insurance policy. Then they have a duty to defend the client if the case is disputed by a third party. Subrogation is a concept that allows one person to be substituted in place of another relative to a lawful claim. This is important in insurance because insurance companies have the right of subrogation. They can step into the shoes of the party they compensate and sue any party the compensated party could have sued. So think about in a car wreck. If you're in a car wreck and it, your insurance company pays and it turns out it's not your fault, the insurance company may sue any member of the, anyone who is a party to the car wreck if you could have sued such party. There are many types of insurance. We are going to talk about these three in this section, life, property, and health insurance. First, life insurance is an insurance contract that provides monetary compensation for losses suffered by another's death. Premiums for life insurance are based on many factors, including the age and health of the insured, the coverage, and the type of policy. If you've ever purchased life insurance, you know you usually have to have a, a short medical exam. They might take your blood pressure, weight, height, all of those things. Younger people are cheaper to insure because, of course, they're less likely to die. And healthy people are cheaper to insure because they are less likely to get sick and pass away. When we're talking about life insurance, there's, there's different types. Straight life insurance requires the payment of premiums throughout the whole life of the insured and pays the beneficiary the face value of the policy upon the insured's death. This is called ordinary life or whole life insurance. Universal life insurance allows the policy owner flexibility in choosing and changing the terms of the policy. These types of policies are often investments, so you can draw on them, you can receive dividends from them. There's limited payment life insurance, which provides for payment of premiums only for a certain time, so 10, 20, or 30 years, but the amount of the policy will still be paid to the beneficiary upon the death of the insured, whether the death occurs during the payment period or after. All right, and then finally, there's term insurance. This kind of insurance is just issued for a particular period of time, usually 10 or 20 years, and it's the least expensive kind of life insurance because they have no cash value or loan value. So if you have a term policy and it's a 10-year term policy, if you pass away during those 10 years, the policy will pay out benefits. If you don't pass away during those 10 years and you don't renew the policy, the insurance company will not pay when you pass away. A lot of parents use these types of term insurance policies to provide for, for the care of minor children they might get a 20-year policy, and then if the, the parent passes away while the child is a minor, that policy will pay out to whoever the guardian is of the child. But after that, the, the insurance is no longer in effect because they think that the child will be able to take care of themselves. An annuity is a guaranteed retirement income purchased by paying either a lump sum premium or making period periodic payments to an insurer. So um, an annuity is often what an insured may choose to receive. So the insured may choose to receive either income for a, for a certain fixed number of years with a beneficiary receiving whatever is left of the annuity, or they might choose to receive payments as long as the insured lives and upon death relinquish whatever is left of the annuity. 
So a lot of times these policies don't pay out one big lump sum, they pay out a stream of payments, and that is what an annuity is. An insured may also choose double indemnity, which provides that if the insured dies from accidental causes, the insurer will pay double the amount of the policy to the beneficiary. This is also called an accidental death benefit. These are just options. Of course, it's going to cost more to get double indemnity. Okay, so moving on to property insurance. Common property insurance policies have a deductible, which is an amount of any loss that is to be paid by the insured. So it's what you have to pay generally before the insurance company will start making payments for you. The bigger the deductible, the lower the premium charged for the same coverage. Coinsurance is another common thing in property insurance and other types of insurance. It's an insurance policy provision under which the insurer and the insured share cost after the deductible is met according to a specific formula. Fire insurance is a contract in which the fire insurance company promises to pay the insured if some real or personal property is damaged or destroyed by fire. So here's a typical coinsurance clause. It states the insurance company will pay that part of a loss the insurance carry bears to 80% of the replacement cost of the building. So here um, we have, let's see, Felipe Garcia's house. It's going to cost $100,000 to replace it. He ha only has $60,000 of insurance, so the insurance company would pay only three-fourths of any loss. All right, so the amount of the insurance carried is $60,000. They will only pay 80% of the replacement cost. So 80% of $100,000 is $80,000. So they're going to pay three quarters of every, essentially every bill that comes through to replace this house. If a fire partially destroys the building, causing $40,000 worth of damage, because of the coinsurance clause, Garcia would recover $30,000 from the insurance company. You could also purchase marine insurance. Ocean marine insurance is going to cover ships at sea. Inland marine insurance is going to cover goods that are moved by land carriers such as rail, truck, and airplane. All right, now moving on to homeowner's insurance. A homeowner's policy is going to give protection for all types of losses and liabilities related to home ownership. It'll cover any damage that occurs to both the outside and the inside of the house. Most policies include fire coverage. Um, they usually cover personal property or up to 50% of the limit on the insured dwelling. They may or may not cover flooding. It really depends on the contract. So when you have a homeowner's policy, you should read it and make sure it covers what you think it covers. And if it doesn't, make sure you purchase additional riders to add to that. To recover on a homeowner's policy, the policyholder must demonstrate that he or she had an insurable interest in the property at the time the damage was inflicted on the property. In the case of real property, land and anything attached to the land is going to be an in insurable interest, and then when real property is owned by more than one party, each party is called a tenant, and each party who has part ownership has an insurable interest in the property. Flood insurance is usually an additional type of insurance that isn't covered under your homeowner's insurance policy. And to obtain such coverage, special flood insurance must be obtained from an insurance agent. Most of that insurance is backed by the National Flood Insurance Program, which is established by Congress. Renter's insurance is something that protects a tenant against damage or loss of personal property, stolen personal property, liability for a visitor's personal injury, and liability for negligent destruction of the rented premises. Renters often do not purchase insurance, but they, ought, they should purchase insurance. So if you're renting, a renter's policy is a great thing to have, and it probably is required under your lease. And it's going to cover your things if, if they get destroyed. So if your rental dwelling catches on fire, the owner's insurance will cover the structure, 
that the owner's insurance will not cover your personal property inside. So your furniture, your clothes, your jewelry, all of that. That's what a renter's policy is for. Same thing if your home or apartment were to be burglarized. The owner's policy would not cover that loss. You would have to have a policy to cover that loss. Some property, notably rental property, also demands protection. Even though the owner may not set foot in the property for years, dwelling insurance is going to protect the actual structure from damage caused by fire, wind, snow, ice, lightning, and so on. Okay, moving on to automobile insurance. The most common types are bodily injury liability, uninsured motorist, medical payments, property damage liability, collision insurance, comprehensive coverage, substitute transportation insurance, and towing and labor insurance. Automobile insurance generally provides for indemnity against losses resulting from fire, theft, or collision with another vehicle and damages arising out of injury by motor vehicles to the person or property of another. One thing to always remember about car insurance and accidents in general is that the law in relation to determining fault in such accidents differs greatly from state to state. And also the required insurance coverage is going to vary greatly from state to state. For liability insurance, when a party's actions, business, and property imperil others, that party should buy insurance that will provide it with a legal defense team and with the money to reimburse the victim should the legal defense team fail to successfully defend that party. Just thinking back to automobile insurance in Texas, if you drive a car, you're supposed to have liability insurance, and that's exactly what that liability insurance is for. It's supposed to compensate people who you might injure while driving, and it's supposed to defend you in the case of suit. Moving on to health insurance. Health insurance policies often include the following. Physician care, prescription drugs, inpatient and outpatient hospital care, surgery, dental and vision care, and long-term care for the elderly. A lot of people obtain health insurance through a group insurance plan from, from their work. Um, you can also buy an individual plan from an insurer. You can buy an individual plan through the, the government marketplace. You can also have government health insurance plans through Medicare or Medicaid. Medicare is a federally funded health insurance program for people 65 years of age and older. Medicare Part A helps pay for inpatient hospital care, and Part B pays for 80% of doctors and other medical services. So Medicare does not cover 100% of doctors and medical services. A lot of people buy their own insurance to, to cover the difference, the 20%. That's Medigap insurance. Medicaid is a health plan for low-income individuals. Umbrella insurance is an individual or a business who purchases a policy that will grant coverage beyond the limits of a standard policy provided by the insurer in exchange for higher premium payments. So if I own a business, I would insure my structure against damage. I would insure my workers, my key workers against death. I would in I have liability insurance for whatever I'm doing and that could harm people. But then also I might have an umbrella policy, which basically is an overarching policy to cover things that each individual policy does not cover. I might also have cyber insurance coverage. That's going to cover a number of situations that might endanger or cripple a computer system or that after a computer attack might cause later unanticipated difficulties. This would provide coverage for the damage that might result from computer fraud and computer theft. An insurance policy, the applying for an insurance policy is going to involve a few steps in a few different documents. So first there's an application and it's an offer made by the applicant to the insurance company. Everything on there needs to be truthful. If it's found to be untrue, that's first of all insurance fraud. And second of all, it's, it gives the insurance company a way to cancel your policy. 
There is a binder, which is a temporary insurance coverage until the policy is formally accepted. It's often called a binding slip. There are premiums. This is the amount that the insurance contract requires in payment. And then payment is going to be determined by the nature and character of the risk and how likely the risk is to occur. So this is usually de determined by actuaries. And so they just look at statistics, basically. And they set premiums based on statistically how likely the insurance, the insurer will have to pay out. A lapse is when the insured stops paying premiums. And if we stop paying, paying premiums, we no longer have insurance coverage. An insurance policy may be canceled for one of the following reasons. First, a warranty violation, when the insured fails to abide by restrictions, especially written into the policy. The second might be concealment, if the insured deliberately withholds fact of material importance to in the insurer's decision to issue a policy. And third, misrepresentation, if the insured gives false answers to questions in the application that materially affect the insurer's risk. All three of these may result in cancellation of an insurance policy. And the concept of estoppel means that an insurer may not deny acts, statements, or promises that are relevant and material to the validity of an insurance contract. So when an insurer has given up the right to cancel a policy under circum certain circumstances by granting the insured a special dispensation, the insurer cannot deny that, disp that dispensation when the chance to cancel or deny liability arises. This is a protection of the insured. Again, insurance is just a contract, and it's a contract that helps mitigate risk. It's a, a piece of the risk management puzzle in a business and in, in our personal investments in our personal lives.